This is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy with another episode of Marxism with fellow editors and fellow Marx, Mark Livecki and Mark Melton. And today we're reviewing three pieces from Providence this week. One, a uh, book review by our contributing editor, Rebecca Heinrich of Joss Mitchell's uh, new uh, work called America Awakening. Secondly, uh, James Wood responds to uh, Shadi Hamid's article in The Atlantic about the religionization of politics in America. And finally, Rebecca Munson uh, reviews how uh, U.S. Uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan inevitably will fuel a degeneration of the human rights situation there. Starting with uh, Rebecca Heinrich's piece, Josh Mitchell, who is also a contributor pr to Providence has written a book, uh, which is partly a critique of identity politics and also a reflection on the religionization of American politics and how themes of uh, redemption, guilt and sin now infuse our political discourse. Uh, there was one point uh, that Rebecca highlights from Josh's book that I found especially interesting in that uh, many um, uh, conservative critics today fault uh, John Locke as the uh, supposed author of modern liberalism and autonomous individualism. Uh, but Mitchell, uh, in effect, uh, contrasts Locke with, uh, say, French universalism, uh, pointing out that Locke was a defender of uh, private property, of uh, the family, and also that uh, he was only a universalist in the sense that he was a Christian universalist and anticipated only a genuine unity uh, at the end of time uh, in, on God's uh, own schedule, not an artificial human generated uh, global unity. So uh, Mark Levecki, uh, your thoughts on Rebecca's review, uh, Josh's book and uh, some of those comments I just cited. Great review of a great book. We've lauded the book before. I think the book continues to be, uh, continues to deserve being lauded and widely read, all of that. Uh, I appreciated Rebecca's uh, defense of Locke. I, I know that Locke is presently controversial. Providence friends uh, uh, support him. Other Providence friends denounce him. Uh, I think she's right, Mitchell's right, to point out, as, as you've discussed, that um, Locke can be misunderstood with this idea of universalism. When he pushed for truths, he was pushing for particular truths and only particular truths uh, will sustain the kind of uh, political regime that Locke had in mind, certain kinds of gas fuel, particular kinds of cars, other types of fuel simply won't work. Uh, I think in modern sensibilities, when we read Locke, we could misread that and we think he is saying something far more universalistic um, if it is far more universalistic than those who think that the problems we see in liberalism today are features, not bugs, could be proved right. But I think on Mitchell's reading of Locke, and this is going to be unpopular with several friends in my Twitter feed, uh, Mitchell's reading of Locke, which is, I think, not being a Lockean scholar, is the correct one, uh, points out that, or would argue that the, the problems we see in liberalism are not features. They're, they are indeed bugs, and they are therefore things that um, we can expunge uh, from the liberal project, um, but that's going to take something like an embrace of particular truths, uh, which is going to be enormously unpopular, as, as she cited in, the, in her uh, mild defense of Tucker Carlson's sort of inane fight that he picked with uh, the U.S. military. Um, there are particular truths that he highlighted in an inelegant way um, that, uh, that are unpopular and you know, until we start talking about particular truths again and get away from this crazy idea that truths are individualistically decided, uh, then the public's not going to move forward. So with that in mind, I think the book and Rebecca's endorsement of the book is, is excellent. Mark Melton, uh, turning to you, uh, Rebecca Munson uh, reviews the situation in Afghanistan, the uh, inevitable drawdown of the U.S. military presence there after nearly two decades. And uh, with it, uh, inevitably, the decline of uh, human rights, uh, women especially, will uh, suffer uh, from the lack of the U.S. presence as old habits reassert themselves. Uh, 
tragic and almost inevitable. She's hoping that there'll be some amendment of this process that will preserve some of the human rights uh, regime, but the situation is not bright. And yet, uh, what other choices are there? The US has invested hundreds of billions of dollars and uh, 20 years of national effort, uh, which cannot be eternal. So uh, how do we look at this situation as Christian realists, do you think, Mark Melton? Well, it is a difficult situation because we've been there for decades now. And, uh, you know, it's a country that would have been ranked in the bottom tier of human rights before. And so to move it from a country that's in the bottom tier to slightly higher is incredibly difficult. I think it's unrealistic to think that it would be a bastion of human rights within a couple of decades. I'm kind of reminded of the American South after the Civil War and after Reconstruction when the North abandoned Reconstruction, the South reverted back to some very horrific policies and did some very horrific things. And uh, it seems like a parallel today with the you know, if we pull out, there will be um, a deterioration of human rights there. That seems pretty inevitable. But the sustainability of keeping troops there long term is also a very difficult situation, especially when Americans are focused on other topics. It seems that Americans mostly concerned about human rights when it's something that's on the news. Like I know that with the atrocities in the Balkans in the 90s, it was really news reports that brought news reports and you know, photographs that brought that atrocity to the Americans attention that actually drove a response from the Americans. And so when we have so many other things that are on our mind, it's going to be hard to sustain any type of long term American presence that would address human rights there. But at the same time, we're talking about a country that was, like I said, at the bottom of the rung with uh, human rights before. And, uh, you know, a small improvement may be all that can be achieved at this time. Mark Levecki, it uh, seems to me that uh, as Christian realists, we support the advocacy of human rights everywhere at all times, but in terms of the exertion of American power, obviously there are limitations. We promote them uh, where at all possible, but uh, we understand that there are limits to uh, what the American people are able and willing to support uh, beyond a certain period of time. Uh, uh, but even in the worst case scenario, it seems to me that after the U.S. withdrawal, uh, Afghanistan will still be in a marginally better situation than it would have been uh, 20 years ago under the full control of the Taliban. But your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that's right. It's, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, ought to be at some level heartbreaking to any sort of sensitive charitable individual. At the same time, uh, you know, it gets the dander up of sort of the red-blooded American who wants to be resolved that American power can solve all the world's problems. Uh, the last two decades, hopefully, has put the nail in the coffin of that ambition. Uh, it, of course, has not, and we'll, we'll stick our, our foot in it again. Um, this highlights Nigel Biggers' uh, complaint about sort of uh, the, the human rights agenda. That simply because there are human rights somewhere in the world, uh, it doesn't directly point to who it is that's supposed to meet those rights. Um, so yes, there are going to be human rights abuses when we leave Afghanistan. The question might be, well, why should the American military or political system or the American people be the ones to champion those rights? That would be a Christian realist response. Another Christian realist response, which is more uncomfortable, is that, well, it should be us because we were there and we sort of broke the system and, and as Melton said, we didn't um, create the system, uh, but now we're leaving and there's every reason to believe that certain bad habits are going to fall back into place. So somebody else might argue, well, you were there, you got yourselves involved, now you're responsible. Uh, and so then you have to fall back on what you can do versus what you want to do or wish you could do. Uh, and that's gonna become much more modest and so, uh, you know, the, the is in this situation influences the ought. Now, the ought ought to stay as our horizon, and we ought to try to rearrange circumstances on the ground uh, in a way that in the future, the ought is a little bit more um, realistic. That might be creating regional partners, you know, continuing to be involved in the Afghan economy, um, you know, proclaiming and, and, and speaking the truth when it needs to be spoken. Uh, and doing what we can and figuring out those what those modest 
steps are, uh, but it's pretty clear we can't be involved in the way we've been involved in the last two decades. So that's that ought to be frustrating and humbling and all the rest. And finally, uh, James Wood, who I think is uh, ordained in the Presbyterian Church in America, is that right, Mark Melton? Yeah, I think he's PCA. Uh, writes his critique of Shadi Hamid's uh, Atlantic piece, uh, lamenting the religionization of Amer uh, American politics. And in essence, at least from James Wood's perspective, advocating a, a bifurcation between religion and politics, which James Woods finds uh, concerning in that uh, politics cannot be separated from metaphysics. He says that uh, humanity is an an intrinsically uh, spiritual. And uh, in that sense, uh, if not the state, uh, certainly uh, civil society and religious institutions are going to have to provide a, a metaphysics of uh, politics. So in that sense, politics will always be relig religionized. It's just a question of uh, to what extent or what kind of religion is going to influence politics. So Mark Levecki, your thoughts? Yeah, I, 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 I confess to not having read Hamid's piece in The Atlantic, which, which would be more thorough. Uh, but from what Wood describes, I, I think Wood has the advantage here. Uh, you know, I, I'm sympathetic with the idea from Hamid's perspective that religion should be separated from politics when you consider certain kinds of religious interference and religious um, occupation of politics throughout the world, right? We don't want Sharia law. You know, there, there's all sorts of ways that religion can meddle within politics uh, that's excessive. And so, okay, we don't want that. Uh, but to separate politics from metaphysics is, as Wood says, one, impossible. Um, you know, you can separate uh, orthodox religion from politics if you want, uh, but there's going to be a void uh, and that void is eventually going to be filled by somebody who looks like Buffalo Boy in the Capitol building, right? So that's not desirable and that's not an improvement. Uh, I, think, I think the trauma of the idea is more plain uh, maybe when you think, okay, removing metaphysics from politics also means removing political concerns from metaphysics. And so then all of a sudden, what does it mean to be, uh, in our case, Christians in the world if we're not concerned about political life? Um, Jean Elstein said, you know, for better or for worse, everything is political. Um, you know, there is no non-political sort of uh, idea in public life out there. And Christians are called to be involved in the public life. You know, the solution to bad politics is better politics. It's not withdraw from politics. Christians should be the ones who forward political solutions that either can be argued and proved to be reasonable and uh, persuasive uh, or that are self-evidently so because we simply have a better understanding of the way reality works. Uh, so Woods is right. I mean, we, we can ignore reality, but reality is not going to ignore us. Um, we have to be involved in it. Um, that said, I think, um, I think they're also right to say that uh, the kind of preoccupation that thinks everything hinges on a certain type of uh, political life uh, is also false. We've seen how human life in various ways, in complete ways, can flourish under almost any political regime. Those are less desirable, but that, that helps to indicate that political life isn't the only life. Um, and so maybe we end up with something like, you know, uh, an understanding of Christian involvement in political life that looks something like the incarnation. We're not separate from it. Uh, we're 100% involved in political life and we're 100% withdrawn. And I don't know entirely what that looks like, um, but I, you know, I want that to try to express both the responsibility of participation, uh, but also the recognition uh, you know, that not everything hinges on, on political life. Wood uh, cites Jacques Maritain in saying, yes, there needs to be a, a civil creed for political life, but religious institutions and religious people can construct religious arguments uh, to support the architecture of that uh, civil creed. Mark Melton? Yeah, I've heard that um, argument before and uh, kind of like what kind of build off on what Levecki was talking about. I think Christians are definitely 
you know, called and commanded to seek the peace and prosperity of where we are. I think that passage in, I believe in Jeremiah mentions like the city it's talking about where the Israelites have been exiled to. And so I think that is a way to love our neighbors and to care for them and that we really have to be concerned with state, local and federal government with those things and being engaged, being knowledgeable in all of those issues. And, uh, and it really gets down into this, I've mentioned this multiple times before, but gets down into the local small communities that we need to really focus in on. And that's where I think a lot of the work needs to be done for Christians. On that note, to gentlemen, uh, thank you. Uh, may you have a blessed uh, Palm Sunday. Until next week, bye-bye. Take care.